What's happening, everybody, and welcome back to the Funky Brain Podcast. And my name is Dennis, and this is my Funky Brain. And I'm pretty excited today to have one of the co-authors for the book, The Dr. Feelgood Casebook. Today, I have Mr. Rick Lertzman and his partner, Bill J. Burns, William J. Burns, um, was having some problems with our video stuff. So we're just going to talk with Rick this morning about the book. And it's a great book. It tells the story of Dr. Max Jacobson, a.k.a. Dr. Feelgood who lived uh, decades ago and how he helped the international celebrities and legends that we all know about. And it covers stories about everybody from legends like Elizabeth Taylor and Marilyn Monroe, John F. Kennedy, and more to more modern figures like George Clooney and Donald Trump. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dennis. Awesome, man. I'm so excited. This is really great. And I, I, I can't wait to hear a little bit more about this. It's such an interesting premise. Like, like how and when did you guys come up to decide on putting all this together. We, we were researching a book for, for an, uh, an actor named Robert Cummings. And he was a famous actor. He uh, did a lot of A films. He did Hitchcock's film, a, lot, a few Hitchcock films. And, he, and so as I was doing the research, I discovered that he was a health addict and he was known outwardly for writing a book called How to Stay Young and Vital. And he was one of the first natural food advocates. While I was doing that, I met a, a gentleman named Art Linkletter, who used to host a show on television called House Party and Art Linkletter, and he was well-known, and he was Bob Cummings' best friend, along with Ronald Reagan. In interviewing him, he said, well, you know, the time that Bob was put into a straitjacket and sent to an asylum for his meth addiction, and it blew me away because here's a guy who was known as this health fanatic, and he had started seeing Max Jacobson in the 1950s Rod Serling from the Twilight Zone sent him there. They were, they were working on a project called 12 Angry Men. And Bob Cummings went there and became uh, addicted to meth basically until he passed away in 1990. As we, as we were researching this, we found out here's Max Jacobson. There was a little snippets about him as the doctor of President Kennedy and that he had treated John Kennedy in the 1960s. So as I started doing research, I got to meet his widow, his daughter. I got to meet people like Gore Vidal and uh, 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 the list is endless. Johnny Mathis, people from that era who were patients. And it turned out that not one, but there were hundreds. And I met his wife and I got his patient list and it absolutely blew me away. I mean, here is Pope Pius XII, Winston Churchill, Harry Truman, uh, Richard Nixon. I mean, it just was... uh, an astounding list. And then we acquired his his actual manuscript that he wrote when he was being disparred by the uh, New York uh, uh, board in, in 1973. And in this manuscript, which was kind of an angry manuscript, he told the story of his, his uh, life in Germany, his escape from the Holocaust, his coming to America, and people he treated. So he told about uh, people like po- uh, Pope Pius and Cecil B. DeMille, and John Kennedy, and Jackie Kennedy, and uh, senators, actors, and writers, Tennessee Williams, and Truman Capote, and it just was astounding. The more research we did, the more we found that this was a man who really created that part of society, that method the methamphetamine addiction from that era. So for those that are listening that aren't sure, because we all have heard about like meth, right? And we're trying, everybody hears about it in the news and everything, and what exactly is it? How addictive is it? Like, what does it do to you, to you physically, mentally? And what are the benefits of this magic formula? Well, Max Jacobson studied under a guy named, one of the great physicians named Dr. August Beer in Germany. And he created a synthetic methamphetamine that was used, it was, became pervidin in Germany. And he created it in pill form in Germany. It was later used for the Nazi Luftwaffe when they flew over Germany, they had to take it to stay awake for hours and hours and hours. So Hitler used him and then he escaped out of there. But he believed that using methamphetamine, uh, he initially used it on people who had multiple sclerosis because it would take their pain away. It, As Truman Capote explains, you fly high, you feel like Superman, you feel like you're invincible, and then you crash. And so a lot of creative people who Max Jacobson treated 
he had this great creative burst and great creative period. So uh, Truman Capote wrote in Cold Blood. Rod Serling wrote uh, all these great plays. He wrote everything from The Planet of the Apes to um, uh, Requiem for a Heavyweight and, and The Twilight Zone. It gave him this great burst of energy, except the downside is it dragged him down. Tennessee Williams said it nearly destroyed his life. And he wrote, although he wrote some of his great work with under methamphetamine, the trade-offs weren't great because it destroyed your life. And um, we talked a, a lot to a lot of people who were affected from uh, uh, Gore Vidal, who was a great writer and uh, uh, one of the great minds. Uh, he wrote everything from Myra Breckenridge to uh, books about Aaron Burr. Uh, he was part of the Kennedy clan. And but his he said the trade offs were 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 horrid. I mean it just it actually nearly destroyed his life. And so it it gives you this uh, great energy, this great feeling of invincibility. John Kennedy uh, was on the uh, campaign trail in 1960, and he he was in the West Virginia primaries. And John Kennedy suffered from Addison's disease, along with the lower back ailment he he acquired during World War II when he was the commander of the PT-109, which crashed. So he really had a hard time walking. He had Addison's disease. And he came to his friend, his name was Chuck Spaulding, who he went to college, his college roommate. And he said, John, I have this doctor. He has this vitamin pill, this vitamin shot. It'll rejuvenate you. So John Kenny said, I'll try anything. So he went into this office, and it was this office that was kind of filthy and dirty. And this doctor came out in a white lab coat that was speckled with blood. His fingernails were dirty. And he looked at John Kennedy. He goes, come back with me. I will, I will take care of you. So John Kennedy goes back and he gets, his, he gets an injection of 25 milligrams of methamphetamine. And all of a sudden, John Kennedy feels no pain. His back pain is gone. His mind is very acute, very, very sharp. He loves Max Jacobson. So Max Jacobson throughout the 1960 campaign for president is at his side. So when the debates come in 1960, later in, in September of 1960, Kennedy is, is, is behind the polls behind Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon comes in and he looks bedraggled. He has his five o'clock shadow and Kennedy has just been injected just before the show with, with 50 milligrams of methamphetamine and he looks energetic and like a young hero and he, he doesn't have any signs of fatigue and that carried him over into his election win. So from that point on, he became John Kennedy's doctor. And when Jackie Kennedy suffered from postpartum depression from having a loss of a child, she became a patient of Max Jacobson and she was addicted the rest of her life until she passed away in the late 1980s. So it's, it's an amazing, what he did was he really is kind of the Forrest Gump that you always see in all the pictures. We, we found pictures with Max standing behind Pope Pius, Max behind Willie Brandt in Germany, Max uh, with Cecil B. DeMille making Ten Commandments. He was a man that was under the radar. People believed in it, and they called it his, his, his vitamin shot, but everybody knew that it was far more than vitamins. So all these stories that you're talking about, they're all documented. We have, we have Max's actual manuscript, but we also went to the Kennedy Library. We, through the Freedom of Information Act, we got the FBI files. Um, we've interviewed Max. We've spent a lot of time with Max's family. His son, Doc, Dr. Thomas Jacobson, who's still alive, is uh, nearly 90, was Max on the West Coast. So he, would, he injected, he was, when, when Max was in, based in New York City, Tommy Jacobson became a physician out in Los Angeles. So he injected Marilyn Monroe. Uh, he was with Marilyn Monroe the night she died, the night she, she overdosed on drugs. Um, he injected people like Angie Dickinson and Frank Sinatra and everybody on the West Coast. So I, we've interviewed Tommy Jacobson, and he told us his story about his use of Max's drugs. Uh, we've interviewed count, really over 100 people and looked through files, and we bought all of Max Jacobson's office records. So we were able to read his notes on these patients. And it is, it is just mind boggling when you see the effect he had on literature, on film, performers and senators, senators like Senator Claude Pepper, the White House photographer, Mark Shaw, 
We've interviewed his family. Uh, Mark Shaw was murdered by Max Jacobson. As we turned out, we found out Max also, who was self-injecting the drug, uh, turned out to have a sociopathic bent. So that took another cur- turn for, for our book. That's awesome. This is such a great story. So we're talking with Mr. Mr. Rick Lertzman. And he's the author of, co-author of Dr. Feelgood Casebook. And you can buy this on Amazon. Is that right? It's on uh, Amazon, Barnes Noble. You can buy it in a book form, on ebook. Um, I have a wonderful copy here. <laughs> we had a, an original book in, in 2013 called Dr. Feelgood. And that told the story. And our publishers deleted a lot of information out of that book, which was which upset us and narrowed the book from a 700-page book. It became a 280-page book. And it had the basic details and patient list. So we decided to come back and, re, and retell stories that were taken out. And that includes Max's original manuscript, which we included in total and unedited. And we leave Max tell his own story, which is uh, an amazing story. And Max tells it in his own words and talks about John Kennedy and treating Jackie Kennedy as well. So we're going to take a quick break here and then we'll be back in just a minute. Hey, Dennis here. Have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, I need to quit? Or maybe you've tried dozens or even hundreds of times on your own, but you can't do it. If you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, call me now for a free 20-minute consultation. We'll just talk for a little bit and we'll see if you don't feel better. And while we're all dealing with the COVID pandemic, I'm offering two free full 40-minute coaching sessions. We'll get you set up with the tools you need to become successful in recovery and sobriety. I know from experience, having been sober since April 8th of 2003, that it is not easy, but you don't have to do it by yourself. I'm here to help. We'll do it together. If I can get clean and sober, anybody can. So call me right now, not tomorrow when you're sick and hungover again, right now. I'm here to help. Have a great day. So what's one of your favorite stories from the book? My favorite story is it's kind of an extended story. Um, Max Jacobson would go to the White House about three times a week. And uh, a gentleman named Michael Samick, who was a, a World War II hero, also and who was, had escaped Nazi Germany and was a colonel in the Air Force. And, and he became the, the chairman of Rand Corporation. So he was a very powerful man, had his own private jet, and he would fly Max to the White House about three times a week. So during one of the visits, he came. He, they, they came and they went under the tunnel to get into the White House. And standing there was Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, who was Attorney General of the United States. And Bobby said, I know what you're giving my cl- my brother. I had it tested. It's methamphetamine. It's human placenta. It's eel. It's monkey gonads. It's sheep sperm. He goes, you're injecting my brother with all this. You quack. You New York fraud. And he, he, used, some, he used some anti-Semitic slurs toward him. And Jacobson was, although he had great respect for the president, he, you know, he took offense to being, had these, these, these slurs thrown against them. And they were anti-Semitic. And they, they, he said, if you ever do try again, I will have the FBI, I'll come down your throat. So Max Jacobson left, went back to his office in New York, and wrote a letter to Evelyn Lincoln, who was the president's secretary, and resigned. And John Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy went berserk. So John took a plane, flew to New York, and he had always he always stayed at the Carlisle Hotel in New York. He got a whole floor in New York, and the floor below are, is the press corps. He's, he's in there, and he calls Max Jacobson. He says, Dr. Jacobson, I'm in New York. I want to meet with you. Please, I want to make amends. Jacobson comes in, and he says, Dr. Jacobson, I need the injection. It really helps in everything I do. And please, 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 and do not listen to my brother. I want you to be my physician. So Jacobson injects him with 25 milligrams of methamphetamine. And Kenny said, you know, I really need a double shot because I haven't had it for a couple of weeks. And Ken, and so he says, no, 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 not, not. He says, no, no, please, please. And he says, and Jacobson writes, you can't argue with the president. So he injects President Kennedy with 25 milligrams more, which he's overloading him with methamphetamine, and he knows it. He leaves. John Kennedy goes into a psychotic breakdown because of the the overload of drugs, and he starts taking off all of his clothes. He's completely naked, and he runs through the halls of the Carlisle Hotel screaming, look at me, I'm free, and I'm free. And 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 the Secret Service agent who we interviewed, his name is Paul Landis, goes, we don't know what to do. We can't put him in a straitjacket. He's, he's the man who has, has to have the button, and we can't 
lock up the president's straight jacket. So they don't know, and they're panicking because John Kennedy goes toward the stairwell, and he wants to run down the stairwell, and below there is the press, and it's all the press need to see is a naked president in a psychotic break. They make a call to Cornell University, and the chief of psychiatry, his name was Dr. Lawrence Hatterer, came in and uh, gave uh, uh, Kennedy some sedatives. And we know this because we interviewed Dr. Lawrence Hatter, who was in his 90s when we talked to him. And Dr. Hatter said, I, I injected him with a sedative, calmed him down, then turned to the Secret Service agent. I said, who is the man who did this? And they said, it's Max Jacobson. We, we code, and his, by the way, his Secret Service code name of Max Jacobson was Dr. Feelgood. So they called up, he called up Dr. Jacobson, Dr. Hatter told us, and he said, tell me, Dr. Jacobson, I need to know what you gave the president that sent him off in this, in this psychotic breakdown. And uh, Jacobson goes, no, 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 I do not reveal my formula, but what I will do is you come to my office and I'll inject you and you see how you react to it. And Dr. Hatter goes, not in your life. The problem was at that point is the CIA and the Secret Service and, the, and Alan Dulles and people in that in, in that service became very nervous that the president was unstable and they saw it firsthand and they worried and which they should worry because later on after this event um, came the Cuban Missile Crisis where Max Jacobson also injected him and also the Vienna summit where he met with Khrushchev and he was, he was way over medicated and Khrushchev saw his, his slurring of speech and he, and he turned to his own people and said, we can roll him. He's easy because he thought he was nothing but but a uh, an addicted president, and so that event kind of set off a lot of, of bells and and alarms for for the uh, for the CIA and other uh, parts of the government. These are fascinating stories. I mean, it, like these are things you never think about would have occurred, especially sixty years ago. This was so long ago, and there's so many different types of stimulants or uh, enhancement drugs out there. And so do you think like modern day celebrities and public figures are taking similar drugs or stimulants to like positively affect their performance and their images? Oh, absolutely. We did a series for, Bill and I did a series for uh, the Reels television network and it was called Dr. Feelgood and it was about Max Jacobson, but it was about the other doctors who were similar to him, the ones who treated Michael Jackson, the one who treated Prince, the people, this it, 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 it really has has not gotten, uh, but it's actually grown. Max Jacobson really set that era off, and then it has expanded from there, sadly. And, you know, while it gives short-term sometimes creative people, which Max Jacobson started off with, creative people and people in power, I mean, people have to be before cameras. It gave them this great burst of energy. The downside was very, very dark. Um, when we talked about, we were researching the story of Robert Cummings, who was this actor who did King's Row with Ronald Reagan and uh, Dial M for Murder for Hitchcock. His life from an A-list star and a, a guy who was making a million dollars a year on television, he ended up in a small apartment in Sherman Oaks and his life was destroyed at the age of 80. He uh, was a complete wreck. He um, he had nervous disorders and, and problems, and he had never recovered from it. And um, there's a very dark side that it does. And, you know, Max Jacobson um, believed in, in uh, feeling better to feel good than feel sick or feel not have the energy. And it's and, it, and surprisingly, a lot of people um, uh, followed in, in, you know, Max as a guru, as a god, which he was not. But he was a brilliant man, but he was a very uh, complex and, and dark person as well. Yeah, I mean, the message there is really powerful. It's like we use these, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever stimulants to, um, to get to, to perform better, to get to where we want to be because we can't do it on our own. And every once in a while, it's like I like to drink caffeine in the morning to get going, you know, and there, there's just certain things that we do in our lives. And then but there's a downside to everything like that. And the problem is when you become dependent on it and then it can really like take you the wrong way. There has to be these modern day celebrities using some sort of stimulants. I, I mean, a lot of them snort cocaine or whatever it is before they go up and perform, you know, stand up comics or 
you know, if you're uh, acting in the movies, musicians on stage that need that boost for another four hours of performing at eight o'clock at night, there are people using stuff out there to help get you there. And this is just such a fascinating book. And so, I mean, there's some shocking stories coming out here. Have you run into resistance from other people about telling stories like these? We have, you know, along the way, uh, Rod Serling's wife, her name was Carol Serling, was really angry with us that we told the story of Rod Serling. I, you know, whatever we write, we have to have, and we go through a legal vet through with all publishers, and you have to have backup and stories to prove what you're saying. You can't just throw accusations out there, whether they're dead or alive. We believe in having a, a thorough research. And so Carol Sterling got very angry with us. She said, I don't believe that Rod was on drugs. Well, I had met with Del Reisman, who was the producer of The Twilight Zone. You'll see his name on the, all The Twilight Zones. And it was a great story. He told us that Rod Serling was out in the desert making uh, "Bomber." The bomber will return with 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 Robert Cummings. This is in 1960 for the Twilight Zone, and it was shot in the desert. And it was just Del Reisman, who was the producer and writer of the Twilight Zone, Rod Serling, and Bob Cummings. And so Bob Cummings, they go, they went to a diner to have dinner, and Bob Cummings would pull out uh, his vitamin pills. That's all he would have was vitamin pills and seaweed. And Rod Sterling had this big, giant steak smothered with gravy, mashed potatoes, was smoking cigarettes, had dessert, and Bob Cummings turned to him and goes, Rod, you will not live to 50 doing that, which he didn't. He lived to 50. He said, I predict you will die by the time you're 50. And he turned to Bob Cummings and he goes, Bob, you're on the same crap that I'm on, the methamphetamine. He goes, you're going to be no better because you're shooting up the same way I'm shooting up. And we have Del Reisman telling this story and we have information from Cummings telling that story. And it's it's fascinating. So I've talked to a lot of actors who were who said that Andy Williams, who, who was a well-known singer, and Johnny Mathis, oh God, so many singers and actors. And they told us, to get on stage, Christopher Plummer, who was, uh, you, you may know from The Sound of Music, they said it gave you this great burst of energy. It, before the audience, all of a sudden, you know, you, you felt invincible on stage and you felt invincible as a singer. And they said it just was not worth it. It was not worth to do it. Eddie Fisher was married to um, Debbie Reynolds and then to, to Elizabeth Taylor, and then Connie Stevens. His daughter was Carrie Fisher. She suffered from, and, and I interviewed Carrie Fisher and Eddie Fisher, and Carrie Fisher told of the substance abuse she went through, which she believed it was from her father, that it was passed down from her father. And then I interviewed Eddie Fisher, and he said that it really helped him go through a divorce with Elizabeth Taylor, through the issues he had when he left Debbie Reynolds. And, he, and Max Jacobson was his guru for, for almost 20 years and took him through this period of highs, highs, highs. And then at the end of it, he had such a low that he was uh, destroyed for, for many, many years. So that's great. Sorry. So do you guys have any upcoming projects or um, like sequels to the book or anything like that in mind right now? Well, we have a TV series that's going to be um, probably uh, uh, it's going to be a limited TV series for five years based on Max Jacobson with a well-known actor and uh, probably HBO. So it's going to it's going to be an interesting concept looking at Max Jacobson. And another interesting story is that Max Jacobson, uh, because of his connection to Kennedy, got to know his brother-in-law, whose name was Prince Stash Radswell. And Prince Stash Radswell was a Polish prince. And he was married to Jackie Kennedy's sister, Lee Radswell. Radswell, his wife lived this high, incredibly extravagant lifestyle. He needed money, so he decided with Max Jacobson to open up a lab in Point Lookout, New York, which is near the Hamptons. And they opened up a lab. And in the lab, actor many know as George Siegel, whom they know now from the Goldbergs, but from many movies and everything, George, George Siegel worked there. Um, Felice Orlandi, who was a well-known actor who's married to Alice Ghostly, who, if you remember Bewitched, she was Esmeralda or Designing Women or Grease. And they ran this lab, and throughout the world, they sold methamphetamine. And at that time, it was not a class two narcotic drug, which it became in 1970. It was not listed on that form. So they were able, and, and Stash Radswell had a diplomatic pouch that he was able to carry throughout the world. And they sold this drug throughout the world. Stash Radswell became very, very wealthy. He 
He had a, a, a palatial palace next to Buckingham Palace. His wife, Lee Radswell, was the jet set, and, and it was all through Max Jacobson. Now, Max Jacobson didn't get rich because he was a terrible business person. Well, Stash Radswell made lots and lots of money. But the people that they, they influenced throughout the world, in, in, uh, from Grace Kelly in, in Monaco to, to Winston Churchill in, in Great Britain, it was astounding that uh, they were able to do that. So uh, that should be an interesting project. We also have, uh, we've done books like uh, the Beyond Colombo, The Life and Times of Peter Falk. And Bill and I wrote uh, The Life and Times of Mickey Rooney for Simon & Schuster uh, about Mickey Rooney, who was another addictive and uh, very, very uh, interesting person. Uh, and we have a book coming up on the Rat Pack, uh, which uh, it's, uh, it's going to be out in September, and it's deconstructing the Rat Pack. So we're going to look at almost a lot about Kennedy and how Joe Kennedy use the Rat Pack to get his, his, his son to become president of the United States. This has been really awesome. So once again, how can people contact you if they want to get in touch with you, your website, email, and then, of course, buy your book on Amazon? They can buy your book on Amazon. It's, it's the Dr. Feelgood case book, and that's on Amazon. Uh, and also, if you, want to con- if you want to read our blog, it's called the Life and Times of Hollywood.com. And uh, we're on that or we're on Facebook, The Life and Times of Hollywood. And we have stories about uh, Hollywood and about uh, uh, stories from our books and, and other stories. So that, uh, and you could also contact us through the, through the uh, blog and, and write us a note and uh, leave me more than answer or a- answer any of your questions about, uh, these, about Dr. Jacobson or Mickey Rooney or Peter Falk or people like that. Well, thanks, Rick, for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. Um, Nice, genuine guy. Really enjoyed our conversation. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to the Funky Brain Podcast. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.